test pilots die with almost distressing regularity. It's part of the business, and they accept the risk. Brave men died this past year in crashes of the XV-5A, the A-11, the SR-71, and other airplanes. And one of the things that deeply worries the astronauts, themselves test pilots by training, is that not too much be made of their dying when it happens. That accidents in spaceflight, exposed as it is to the glare of publicity, not be overemphasized. Colonel Frank Borman, the command pilot for our first Saturn V man flight, put it this way. I hope that the people in the United States are mature enough that when we do lose our first cruise, they accept this as part of the business. Pat White, Betty Grissom, and Martha Chaffee had all watched friends' husbands die in testing. They acclimated themselves to it just as a combat GI's family does, and then forgot about it. So it was this past week when Gus, Ed, and Roger, living at the Cape almost full-time, went into the final pre-launch weeks. This was the last film made of them yesterday at the Cape as that simulated flight got underway in the morning. Suited up, they emerged from the transfer van in sunlight and shadow at pad 34. Grissom leading the way, then Chaffee, a suit technician, carrying the portable air conditioning pack up the high-speed elevators, far up to the 218 feet level. This unedited film just rushed in from Cape Kennedy, the first views of the pilots yesterday and indeed the last views of them alive. And here they are emerging at the white room level at 208 feet, 218 feet rather, getting ready to go into the spacecraft. It was a bright sunny day at the Cape, T minus 25 days, just 25 days before Grissom, White and Chaffee were scheduled to lift off in Apollo 1. And it was a routine testing scene, film you would never have seen otherwise had the tragedy last night not taken place. Those were the last films taken of the astronauts. Two weeks before, in an identical pre-launch test, Grissom, White and Chaffee went through the entire sequence. This is the film that was taken at Cape Kennedy on January 10th. The Apollo in place on pad 34, and the astronauts seen here suiting up, Gus Grissom, 41 years old, Roger Chaffee, 32, newly promoted to Navy Lieutenant Commander. Grissom, wiry, tough, but lately far more confident of himself, and Ed White, 36 years old in the center there, our first man to walk in space. The Apollo 1 patch that will now never be worn, designed by Roger Chaffee himself, who was proud of it. And indeed, he caused the flight to be renamed. When the space agency was unable to decide on a name, Chaffee, Grissom, and White went ahead and called it Apollo 1, and we think forced the space agency to rename it at that time. Ed White, the navigator, here working with a sextant and telescope at the guidance and navigation station of Apollo 1, now charred by flame. White, who had practiced hundreds and hundreds of hours to know how to work that sextant and telescope so that the three pilots could always find themselves in space wherever they were. Here they are, suited up in their couches, just as they were yes yesterday, last night at 6.31 p.m., when tragedy struck. Co-pilot Roger Chaffee on the far right, in charge of the electrical system. Senior pilot White, handling the live TV camera, command pilot Gus Grissom. From the beginning, Spacecraft 12, as it was called for this flight, seemed to be plagued by troubles. It was only natural, we told ourselves, it was the first manned vehicle, the most complex flying machine, man and his ultimate ingenuity to break down the barriers of space, time, and gravity has yet devised. Thousands of ground tests were worked out to be sure it would be safe. But as testing went forward, Spacecraft 12 fell behind schedule at North American Aviation's Downey, California plant. First, it was due to be shipped out to the Cape in May. Then June, July, it finally got to Cape Kennedy in mid-August. It's a larger spacecraft by far than Gemini or Mercury, as we're used to, 11 by 13 feet. Here are the two sections, the command module, where the pilots are, and the service module are being joined together or mated. This takes place in the checkout building some distance from pad 34. The fit must be precise, and everything checked out in greatest detail. 
When it is finally assembled, it's transferred to the launching pad in a stack. For Apollo spacecraft 012, this was the final home stretch to the pad. It had been a long journey since it was originally manufactured in California. But the mechanical problems kept cropping up and the date slipped for the flight. When Ap Apollo 12 did arrive in August, the tests began immediately, and we'd hoped for a launch in December of last year. But leaks developed in the environmental control system, the system that provides oxygen and cool air for the astronauts. It developed a leak during an altitude chamber test. Engineers at first didn't have any luck in finding the problem. They finally had to pull out the system before discovering the tiny pinhole. Back it went to California, and a new environmental control unit had to be sent to the Cape. After all these problems, it finally reached the pad to join the Saturn 1B rocket. All was ready and apparently functioning well, all set for a launch date of February 21st, which now, of course, will not be met.